Um, what I'm going to do, what, how I'm going to start right now is to try to bring together a little bit of what we've done over the last two days in order to get us moving onto this third day. Um, and frankly, I think the last two days have been incredible. I've learned a lot and changed my mind about how those things are open my mind to some new possibilities. <laughs> Anne can't believe it. She's known me for years. She thinks I'm lying. No, I'm not getting I really did learn a lot. Um, and I want to name a few of you from whom I learned. Now, I couldn't go to all the workshops. I didn't hear every conversation um, over dinner or whatever. So I'm sure I'm going to leave lots of people out. But um, there, were, there were issues about how to conceptualize the field as a whole. Now, I always learn from the people at Radical Exchange and Deep Matter Labs and from my collaborator, Emily Russell. So, except for Emily, I'm not naming you all personally. Um, I've been reading Katerina Pistor for years, and so I continue to learn from her as she develops her ideas. They have not stayed static. She's been moving with the times and her own understandings of what's going on with the relationship between capital and property. I learned how to think differently and more deeply about a whole bunch of particular subject areas. Damon Silvers on labor, Yulia Panfill on housing, our indigenous brothers and sisters, Ramsey and Pam and others, um, Marie Margot on the rights of nature, Dahir Amin on patents and IP, uh, um, Shrey Jane on IP, and Victoria Ivanova and the others from the Serpentine on partial property ownership in the arts. All of that was great. Either I learned something new, learned something deeper, um, and I hope we all did. Those early talks I thought were incredible. As I said, I didn't get to all the workshops, but there were lots of surprises as well at new people I met, old friends in there and lots of informal conversations. There were a number of people I had never encountered before, but hope to, again, on multiple occasions. Uh, Jeanette Kims, who couldn't be here today, but her creative ideas about how to rebuild and restore and how to organize people to do that was truly inspirational, and she got you all cutting and pasting uh, new models of cities that are underwater or whatever, which I also thought was great. Dr. Joseph Jones, who also couldn't be here today, uh, but thinking through a Southern strategy, uh, coming from the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute, and really pushing us to think about race and identity in very different ways and in a part of the country that has been badly underserved by the rest of us and is doing all kinds of negative things to its own people. Uh, Bill Reed on development and communities. Didn't always agree with you, Bill, but it's good to hear your words. Uh, Linda Shee on the reimagining of urban planning. Kelly, I think it was Kelly, uh, Kelty. Uh, McKeck Carriker on edgy art, its ownership and sale. Is that right, Kelty? Is that the one who has the gallery? Yeah. There she is. Where is she? No, no, no. <laughs> You look very different than she. <laughs> Tyler Hess, who's also left on using food um, to make change. Really interesting side conversations with him about that. Um, the person whose name we always mispronounce, Shanicia. Did I get that more or less right? Shanicia. Shanicia Silman on reparations <laughs> and other things. What? And easements, right, I love that. Um, and then there are a bunch of old friends who were here. Jake Ward, who couldn't be here today, on governing technology. Joel Rogers, probably my oldest friend in many ways in the room, um, on urban wealth funds, work he's done with Matt, uh, and thinking about North Stars, and his stars kept, kept getting more points, and started off as a five star, and then became a Jewish star with six points. I think by the end of that, short discussion, it was eight stars. Oh, that's a make Oscar. That's a make Oscar. There we go. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Ann Pendleton Julian, from whom I always learn, another friend who constantly pushes the boundary of how to create change that is both democratically created and can last. Oh, thank you, Ann. And Tui Shaw will get practical. 
<laughs> and keep a good humor about it as we go along. My best moments had to do, though, with thinking about, or the ones in which I learned the most, really had to do with thinking about real political and economic and social change, which I think is what we're really here to do, and which today is really important to move us along that track. The discussion yesterday that um, G. Kim led so beautifully with Erica Smiley and Derek Hamilton and Saki Bailey, who inspired us to think about big changes in policy and practices in property, around labor and work, around land trusts, um, and scaling them so they aren't as insignificant as uh, some of the statistics <laughs> suggest they are. Um, I don't think they are insignificant. I think they really can be pushing the edge if we organize differently, as she was suggesting we do. Around redistribution of wealth through baby bonds, but also even more radical means. That was just, again, that was an edge. That was the camel's nose under the tent rather than the end of the process. And I think that's important to keep in mind, that that's part of how we get started, um, get some of these policies accepted bigger and more important. And I, I have to admit, I love the session that I led <laughs> on Francis Perkins was ready because we put multiple strategies on the floor and really began to think about what, what we need to do, what we can't do, what we should do, where we can go, how we get there. Um, and I think we need to have more discussions like that, however, whoever organizes them and however they're framed. So I'm going to end where I started um, two days ago with the questions that Emily and I are really addressing in the work that we're doing and the work that we're all doing. Um, the desiderata, or however you want to pronounce it, I think uh, uh, G was calling it desperata, was so important. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. Um, how to learn um, from what's been done, creating a new model of property and ownership, and putting that model into practice. So let me just very briefly go over those four things. Um, so I had some revisions in my thinking, I haven't had a chance to talk to Emily yet, about the desiderata. Yes, yes on well-being and flourishing, that's clearly got to be one of them. Yes, yes on sustainability of the earth, um, its species, and the civilizations and cultures that are part of it. Yes on equality and equity. But there's a renewed concern, at least in my thinking, I don't think we had, we're paying enough attention to bringing in democratic practice and accountability as part of how we restructure our thinking on property and ownership, that that's got to be a piece of it. We're also doing a lot, so the second issue is really learning from what's been done. And there's so many new and exciting examples to explore. I actually left out a slide the other day, but I can now give it to you. <laughs> um, which is part of what Emily and I are doing is to excavate history and ideas to figure out what's, what, what worked, what didn't work, and if not then, could it happen now? As well as looking at contemporary experiments and efforts and strategies that are going on. And when we think about experiments in the past or the history that failed, um, we're beginning to be able to put together some of the reasons why that might be the case, and that helps us to think about how to create experiments that will work in the future. Sometimes it's the wrong time in the wrong place in the wrong context. I always think of Robert Owen and his industrial experiments where he was actually trying to treat the workers right in the 19th century with the development of the industrial mills. But none of the other industrialists wanted to do that, so they drove him out of business. Now a lot of the practices that he introduced at that period are part of normal practice of many factories. So he was just doing the wrong thing in the wrong time in the wrong place, but with a good idea. Sometimes that's not the case. It's a bad idea, or it has bad leadership or bad design. And we need to recognize those cases as well and learn from them so we don't repeat them. Sometimes the problem was they just couldn't scale. Um, there have been successful past and contemporary efforts, though, that we can also learn from. There are forms of indigenous stewardship, often quashed in the past through colonialism or through state intervention of other kinds or 
peoples or other indigenous groups um, who wanted land, but are now reviving, as we heard, in multiple countries and multiple places, and those, that's a model that we need to think about. The commons has the same kind of history. It's been quashed, they're being revived, there are all kinds of new anti-enclosure movements that are developing, and there's things to learn from that. And we also need to think about some things that succeeded that did so for weird reasons and can't be reproduced. So I think of the shakers here, for example. If you're not going to have sex, you're going to have trouble creating a new community, right? And having it grow and keep going on. I'm just using that as a weird example to just make us think beyond the boundaries of what we usually think about. OK. Um, so the next thing, the third thing in our sort of what Emily and I are trying to do is to help create a new model. And here I think I've learned some things, but also increased, if anything, my humility. Um, there's a lot more to do here. I think we are really at just at the cusp, rather than that we've made substantial progress. There's some real advances in thinking about how to restructure ownership of land and of intellectual property rights around art technology discovery, and some of the people in this room are responsible for those advances. There's some real questions, though, of whether challenging that idea that our notion, whether we should be challenging the idea of labor as property, or using the, and our ownership of our own work and time and product, or whether we should be using um, that idea of labor as property as going forward. Should we get rid of it? Should we use it? I mean, there are real questions about that kind of thing. That there, there are interesting ideas that we still have a lot of clarifying to do if we're going to really think seriously about rights of nature or self-owning land or some of these things that are more um, that are really new, and I am yet, not yet convinced we've made enough progress in any sense of those things. And maybe we can't. I mean, that's also something we need to learn. Where, where can we push the boundaries? Where can we not? And there are interesting ideas that may need to clarify the domains of applicability. How do we think about where a certain kind of property rights or ownership structure works and where it doesn't? What do we throw out and what do we keep? Um, what do we learn from the new and what do we say? That's just not going to scale, that's just not going to work. But it works here, but not there. So like, I'm thinking of partial common ownership, mm -hmm. Matt. I think it's a great tool, but sometimes I hear it get used as a hammer. Like it's, it can fit, fit every nail and it can fit some, for sure. So thinking about domains and where these new ideas work and where they don't, I think is part of what where we really still have to stretch ourselves. But the good news is that it's happening. And finally, there's the politics of change itself. And I think the hard organizational work and the real politics of change, where we really mobilize and organize people, get them to act differently, to get them to act in their interests, <laughs> to recognize their interests, whatever they are, whether they're what we think they are, whether it's what they think they are, uh, but to get them to act on the, those interests in a way that actually can affect change and policy. And that hard, hard organizational work uh, really needs to be intensified for, for some of the reasons that Indy offered in his closing remarks yesterday. We're really at the cusp of just a massive societal um, tectonic changes. Um, and we are confronting major disruptions and threats. So we can't wait to organize ourselves and others. We have to do it now. We have to really be thinking about how to do that. So we can't sit back and wait to deal with these problems when they come. They're here. They're coming fast. We have to be ready, like Francis Perkins and others have been. And that means more than ready with policies and proposals. That's obviously part of the story and, and an important part of the story. I don't want to neglect it, but it's not enough. Even more, we have to be ready by ensuring that there is a collective enterprise that incorporates the people who are needing and demanding those changes um, and able to then realize those practices and policies and to evolve them because no solution will ever suffice forever. And we have to be attentive to the worlds we are in. 
and the needs and demands of those immediately around us, as Jessica Trevino, our sister from Oakland, who I don't see today, um, keeps reminding us in our broader circles. Thank you.